And as I mentioned, uh, Mill Creek is opening uh, for our trial run in a couple weeks and then in the pu- for the public in two weeks. And I was out there yesterday, uh, later in the morning, looking over. They were doing a sound check and rehearsal. And, I, and prior to that even, on Friday, they were uh, still r- uh, rushing to get everything set up because stuff was being delivered still. And, I, and when I got there, there was the t- a bunch of tech guys putting together the sound system. And it's way beyond my pay grade to understand what they're doing. But I noticed there's a whole bunch of boxes from amps and things that have been delivered. And all the instructions that come in those boxes were just thrown on the side in a pile. And the guys that were installing it weren't even reading those. But I figured, yeah, they're professionals. They know what they're doing, right? I mean, how many of you read all the instructions when you get in the box? A couple of you really tightly wound people I see out there, right? How many of you like me, like, I don't even look for them. I figure, I got this, right? How many of you, does that go well for you? How many of your wives say, I told you, read the instructions, right? And in the instructions, there are always warning labels, aren't there? There are always warnings about certain things you should or shouldn't do. Um, I, I did a little digging on some uh, in warnings on products. I found it interesting. There, this is, these are, I'm not making these up. Uh, on a particular stroller brand, printed on the stroller itself is a warning label that says, warning, remove infant before collapsing for storage. <laughs> now, why would they write that? Because you know some meathead dad closed that thing up with his kid in there. <laughs> they, they, so they, have, they sued the company. You didn't tell me not to, you know. Or, or I saw one on a Superman costume. It said, warning, Wearing of this costume does not enable wearer to fly. <laughs> Why did they put that on there? Because Johnny jumped off the garage roof with a cape, probably, or something like that, you know? And, and, or, or at least this. I know you've all seen the drug commercials on TV with the list of side effects that they give. How many of you listen to all those? That's terrifying. You, you forget, like, what it was supposed to cure by the time you've listened to all those things. I, I just took a little uh, stab at it. I just listed out the combination of two. I won't name the drugs and in case anybody here is taking them. But um, the, the, the list of two side effects from the, from the more common ones you would hear on TV. Here, here are the side effects just listed in no particular order. Joint pain, general soreness, nausea, vomiting, loss of muscle control, loss of muscle coordination, dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision, ringing in your ears, loss of sense of smell, anxiety, depression, mood swings, trouble sleeping, hallucinations, <laughs> loss of appetite. I could use that. Kidney failure. Liver failure, unusual dreams, tremors, seizures. And then this one, they actually said this on TV. They said, call your doctor immediately if you experience uncontrolled muscle movements as these may become permanent. Ah, like they got like as fast. I can't stop doing this. They took this drug. Or, or, you know, and all kidding aside, there's, there's, I do want to give you one very serious side effect warning for those of you that are thinking of going vegan. I'm kidding. Don't do it. Carrot feet. <laughs> all right. Now, all kidding aside, warnings are actually important, and we really do need them in our lives. But I think there's a very strong human tendency not to listen. If you're like me, we don't pay attention to them. Maybe it's like, oh, yeah, you kind of tune that stuff out. We don't, we don't listen to it. The book of Hebrews, which we're studying, Actually, is a number, there's a series of very important warnings about our spiritual condition. But the readers and hearers in the first century and in the 21st century don't always heed them. We don't always do a good job of paying attention to them. And I think it's critical that we do. A few weeks ago, we looked at the warning about spiritual drift. Take heed, pay careful attention, close attention, lest you drift away. We're going to look at a different warning here. It comes in Hebrews chapter 3. You can follow with me on the screen or in your own Bible. I'm going to read uh, the whole chapter. It's a bit uh, involved, but you'll see if you can pick out the primary spiritual warning for us in this chapter. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation 
and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil and unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were, not able, they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Now, there's a lot going on in there. Uh, but the primary warning, the primary message, I hope you heard it, was a message or a warning about spiritual hard-heartedness. What it means to become calloused and hardened spiritually. The Old Testament command in Psalm 95 is twice repeated, and it gets repeated in the next chapter, which we'll see next week. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. What's a hard heart spiritually? What is arteriosclerosis, right, for our spiritual lives? It, it is a heart that does not believe, does not trust, and does not obey God. The writer of Hebrews is pointing us back to this tragic story in Israel's history. Now remember, he's writing to Jewish believers, Christians, who, followers of Jesus who grew up Jewish. They knew the history. And he's saying, remember back to this, this moment in their history when in the wilderness, after 40 years of seeing God's miraculous hand, his guiding hand, uh, providing for them bread from heaven and water out of a rock and all of these things, and parting the Red Sea, like all that God has done, they're on the threshold of entering the promised land, that which they had longed for. And Moses sends 12 spies. Remember this story? If you know your old Bible history, if you don't, that's okay. I'll summarize it for you. 12 spies go into the land they're supposed to take over. And they come back, and Moses basically says, scout it out, tell us, can we do this? And they come back, and, and 10 of them say, no way. Those people are huge. They're, we're like grasshoppers to them. They had grasshopper syndrome. We can't do it. And two, Joshua and Caleb say, we can do it. We can do it. God said it, we can do it. Who do the people believe? Their God, who they'd seen faithful all these generations, and, and the two, no. They believe the ten. They freak out and they refuse to go in. And God, this is like the, the tragic moment. And of the 600,000 men who left Egypt, over a million people, only two live to go into the promised land because of the hardness of their hearts, because of their unbelief. The couple of key words in this text are uh, rebellion and testing. Those are, the Hebrew word for rebellion is the word meribah. And the Hebrew word for testing is the word Massa. In Exodus chapter 17, Moses names the physical place Meribah and Massa, testing and rebellion. He names the land that. Why? Because that's the spot where it happened, where they said, we're not going. We're go it unraveled. God is saying, go. And they're saying, no. Now, now how, how do you become hard? How does this happen? How does your heart become hardened to God? It doesn't happen overnight. You don't wake up and say, you know, today I think I'm going to grow cold and distant and resist what God wants to do in my life. It happens gradually, little by little, over time. You don't suddenly decide it. Let me just give you briefly the causes of a hard heart. What causes a hard heart? There, there's lots of things, but these four I think we can all relate to. Number one, pain. We don't say it out loud, but most of us subconsciously feel like if we're being faithful to God, we shouldn't experience this kind of pain. We, we should be, you know, somewhat pain-free in our lives. Or, or that the presence of pain is somehow a sign of the absence of God. But that's not what the Bible promises. Nowhere are we promised pain-free lives. We're promised his presence in the midst of pain. Or the second, disappointment. How many of you have given up praying for something? How many of you have stopped seeking and interceding and pleading with God for something because you just didn't see anything happening? How many of you have felt like giving up on God because you thought he'd given up on you? 
you, 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 you didn't, your life didn't turn out the way you expected it to turn out. This is not what you planned. This is not what you thought God would be doing. And you go disillusioned, disappointed. Third, fear. Fear, fear is what, when what you're facing looms larger in your mind and heart than the God that you are supposed to be trusting. This clearly happens for the Israelites, right? We can't go in. They're huge. The, the fear of them is larger in their minds than the God who'd been with them for years, faithfully providing and leading. When a diagnosis comes or something comes into your life some disapp- or someone that you love, and it's terrifying, frankly, and it's all you can see, and you can't see God anymore. Fear causes us to forget God, or at least forget who he is. And that could lead to hardness of heart. Four, neglect. You just stop doing those things you used to do that keep you close to God. You just stop paying attention to those things in your life that keep your heart soft toward who he is and open toward what he wants to do. Maybe that's you. Maybe you can remember a time in your life when I used to, I used to uh, be moved in worship. Now it feels kind of mechanical to me. I, I used to care about that. There are certainly other causes, but these four, I think, are common to all of us. Which most describes you. Hebrews is showing us that spiritual hard-heartedness begins gradually in unbelief, and it grows slowly over time, but it ends up in outright rebellion and rejection of God. And that's somewhere you don't want to be. So what do we do? Well, thankfully, the rest of the chapter really is about the remedy for a hard heart, the things we can do specifically. Let me read to you the first six verses again. Of, uh, it's a little bit, it gets into Moses. We'll make sense of it here. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. As much more glory than the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Now, some of your Bibles might have this section labeled, Jesus greater than Moses. And, and why, why does the writer of Hebrews like, spend so much time making this point? I'm guessing this is not something that was burning in your minds. Like when you came in here this morning, you were thinking, is Jesus greater than Moses or is Moses more important? Like, that, well, it's not a question, it's kind of a duh to us. Like, it's not a question we're asking. But it was for the Jews of, of the first century. It would be very difficult to overemphasize or overstate how big a deal Moses was to the Jewish mind and worldview. The central event of the Jews in the Old Testament was the Exodus. That moment, God showed up and sent a deliverer to take his people out of slavery and bondage and make them his people and bring them into his promised land. That moment, that story, becomes the pinnacle story of their history. And it's the story the New New Testament writers build on to say Jesus now is bringing true freedom and deliverance, not out of slavery, but out of spiritual bondage to sin and death. He's the true and greater Moses. But to the Jewish mind, Moses was a pretty big deal. I mean, people knew him. To quote a movie you shouldn't have watched. I mean, he's a very big deal. He's, uh, I would liken it to, if you grew up in Chicagoland in the 80s and 90s, there's just no comparison. Michael Jordan's the greatest basketball player who ever lived. LeBron James? (laughs) I mean, come on, like we really shouldn't even be having this conversation. He's great, yes, he's good, but he's not MJ. I mean, he's the greatest. He is the greatest, right? We don't even, it's like no discussion, no contest. That's how the Jews looked at Moses. Lots of great prophets, lots of great leaders, but Moses is in a di- class by himself. He's in a different league. So the writer of Hebrews is speaking to Christians now who grew up Jewish, and he's saying, the way you feel about Moses is no comparison to Jesus. And and remember, they're under persecution and hardship, and they're thinking about chucking their their Christianity and going back to Judaism, and he's saying, why would you do that? Don't go back there, because one greater is present now. 
And he says to them, consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. Now that phrase, consider Jesus, it sounds like in English, it's like, have you considered? It's not like that. It's uh, the word for consider is the word kata noeo. Kata meaning down, and noeo meaning like to think, like long thought is what it means. It means literally to think down for a long time. What? Focus, bring your mind to focus down on one thing, the person of Jesus. That's what he's saying. Concentrate. Think deeply about who Jesus is. Consider Jesus. Many of us have had influential people in our lives. I'm guessing you've had mentors or influencers in your life over the years. People that when you were younger or maybe even more recently. And you probably find yourself even subconsciously thinking, well, what did so-and-so say about this? What would so-and-so do in this situation? When I was volunteering as a football coach at Batavia High School many years ago, I would find myself almost automatically thinking about my college coaches who influenced me so deeply. How did they coach me? What the kinds of things did they say? And I found myself at behaving in ways that they did because they had influenced me. That's kind of like, but not exactly like, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. Um, a man who's influenced me deeply is a man named Jerry Root, and he came and spoke to our staff recently uh, about personal evangelism, and if you wonder why I love C.S. Lewis and quote him so much, it's mostly Jerry Root's fault. So Jerry, like, I carry around the, the imprint of that, right, because he's influenced me in this way. But the writer of Hebrews is urging us to do more than just think about what Jesus would have done or what he did. It's not just WWJD. Remember the bracelets, WWJD? Everybody wore those things. And the idea was, you just go about your life, and if you face some difficult situation, you whip out the magic bracelet. What would Jesus do? And you just do that, right? But there's a problem with this behavior because like, it doesn't really work. If you're not living the way Jesus lived, in full dependence on your Father, in intimacy with Him, in a life of prayer and of trust and obedience and humility, then you can't expect in the moment just to do what He did. That'd be like saying, what if it was WWJD? What would Jordan do? right? And I'm supposed to do that. Well, he'd jump over this guy and dunk it. Well, I can't do that. I'm vertically challenged, right? In other words, if you're not living the way he lived, you can't do what he did. But the writer of Hebrews is saying something more than that. He's saying, don't just think about what Jesus would do in the situation. Think about what he has done. For example, if you're struggling to forgive somebody who's hurt you deeply, you just can't let go of that. Consider how much Jesus has forgiven you. Bring your mind to focus on the depth of his love and forgiveness for you, the price that was paid to forgive your sin. Think deeply about that and see if that doesn't begin to break up the hardness of your heart toward this other person. If you're struggling uh, in an area of temptation to give in to a sin and you know you could get away with it and you, know, you rationalize it's not that big a deal and I kind of deserve this anyway, whatever you're saying to yourself. Think about Jesus. Consider him who endured opposition, was tempted in every way like you. Consider what he said in the garden. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. If you're struggling to give up control, you need to control your life and to really surrender and trust God fully. Consider Jesus, who Hebrews chapter 1 says, holds all things together by a word of his power. So the first thing we do to prevent a hard heart is think deeply about Jesus. That may sound elementary, and it is, but it's so important. Ultimately, consider Jesus at the cross. If you're not doing this, th this is crucial to your spiritual life. If you're not setting aside time in your day to think about who Jesus is, to reflect on his word to you, to talk to him in prayer, how are you going to expect to have a relationship with him? To show up once a week and feel mildly inspired by something the pastor says? That was pretty good worship. And forget when you go home. Think deeply about Jesus and what he said to you. And do that continually. That's the first thing that keeps our hearts from becoming hardened toward God. The second thing, listen to Jesus. Think deeply about who he is and pay careful attention to what he has said and what he is saying to you now. In chapter 1 of Hebrews 1, you might remember back when we started this series, we read that the, the, the book begins this way. Long ago, at different times and at different ways, God spoke to us by the prophets. But now in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. He's speaking to you in Jesus. These are those last days. 
Let me read verses 7 through 11 of chapter 3 again. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Notice what he says in the beginning there. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, do not harden your hearts. He's quoting here from Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11 of Psalm 95. Now, every Jewish hearer of, of the letter of Hebrews would have instantly no recognized those words that he's quoting. The reason is because they grew up in Jewish homes. And that, Psalm 95, that text, is what was read every Sabbath at the beginning of the Sabbath in the evening. The beginning of every Sabbath time, every week, Psalm 95, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand. Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Come let us worship him and bow down. These are the words they would have heard every week of their lives. They knew him instantly. But that doesn't mean that they're really listening or they're really hearing what God is saying to them there. Have you had that experience? Just because you've heard something over and over and over again. In fact, sometimes the fact that you have heard it over and over and over again can cause you not to hear it at all. How many of you have read something in the Bible or somewhere and you know you've read it a hundred times before, but you, for whatever reason, it comes alive to you in that moment? Has that ever happened to you? It happened to me all, just, just a couple weeks ago. I started reading this book called Communion with God, written by John Owen in the mid-1600s. He's an old Puritan pastor. A little bit dense reading. I read that years ago because I had to for some class, I think. I picked it up again to read it as devotional material, and it's like I've never heard it. The book has been around since 1600. It's not different, but I am. I'm now in a place where I can hear it. He's talking all about the love of God. The way I connect to the Father is by the Father's love. That's the whole, it's very simple, but so profound. You might pick up God's word, and you think, I know this, I've heard it all before, but maybe you're different now. Your life, your, the pain you've experienced, the disappointment, the challenges, you're in a different place where you're ready to hear something God has been saying to you all along, but you couldn't hear it before. That's why we stay in the word. Notice how the writer begins. He says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says... What's he saying there? He doesn't say as Psalm 95 says, or as David says. In fact, in the next chapter, he quotes the same psalm, and he says, David has written. What's he saying? He's saying th there are human authors to the Bible, but there's one inspiring author behind it all, the Spirit of God. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, by the way, Psalm 95 was written about a thousand years before the, the letter to the Hebrews was written. And we're reading Hebrews to this morning some 2,000 years after it was written. 3,000 years spread, but the Holy Spirit is still speaking through the Word of God. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. It's, it's a timeless sense of urgency. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, today, if you hear His voice. How, how, how can you think you're going to ignore God today, but listen to Him tomorrow? Now, why do you think that if you're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to close him off and ignore him today, but I'll, I'll listen and obey later. You, you, you ignore him long enough, and you can't hear him anymore. Not because he isn't speaking, because you've hardened your heart. Listening, recognizing, and obeying God's voice is actually a sign that you belong to him, that you're one of his. Jesus says this in John 10. He says, my sheep know my voice. They will listen to me. They don't listen to a stranger, but they listen to me. Why? Because they recognize my voice. Yesterday morning, I came over here to kind of say a word of blessing and encouragement to a bunch of people who are heroes to me. They serve in a ministry called Buddy Break. If you don't know what Buddy Break is, it's part of our Masterpiece ministry. Masterpiece is uh, uh, the broad term for ministry to children and families with special needs. It's such a high and difficult calling for these moms and dads who are raising these kids that have unique challenges. But it's also such a gift for us to come alongside them. Buddy break is we give moms and dads a respite for a few hours on a Saturday morning. Well, they, the, the kids are assigned a buddy one-to-one -one where they love that child and play with them and spend time with them so mom and dad can go, you know, have some time off, go to lunch or go shopping or take a nap or whatever they want to do. And I was standing there after, as the kids were watching the families come, and I was standing by a friend of mine named Daryl. Daryl was here last hour. 
And I said, Daryl, who's, who's your buddy? He said, his name's Brandon. I said, tell me about Brandon. He said, well, Brandon's blind. Uh, and I've had him for a number of years. But watch this. When he shows up, he knows my voice. I, I took this picture uh, standing right there, down, right downstairs here yesterday. Daryl called his name. And Brandon's face lit up. And he ran right to Daryl. And they embraced. <laughs> it was just this amazing moment, you know. <laughs> And I just thought, that's such a picture. If you put it back up for one second, Mike. It's such a picture to me of, uh, of God's love for us. And if you're wondering, you and I are the, are, the, are the child. We're the blind ones. We're the ones with challenges. We're the ones that don't see clearly and need help. And he's the one who speaks to us. Why would you not listen to his voice? You know, the, the voice of God that we're called to listen to in his word, it's not a voice of condemnation and judgment and anger and wrath and you better pay attention. It's a voice of love. It's the voice of a father who loves his children. Yes, there are warnings. Any good parent warns their children because they love them. Yeah, there's some hard things in here, but they're set out of love. I just felt like, why would I not listen? Why would, I, why would, I, why would you harden your heart against what, your father who loves you and not listen to what he wants to say? You can see the contrast, I hope, here between a tender child who recognizes the voice and runs right to their father and like the rebellious teenager. Israel was the rebellious adolescent, older adolescent who's like, I know, yeah, 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 dad. I've heard it all before. Rolling their eyes at it, thinking they know best. That's the, co that's the comparison, the contrast. The writer of Hebrews is saying, don't be like that. It doesn't go well for you. Today, do not harden your heart. Last, hold on to Jesus. So we're to consider Jesus, think deeply about who he is. We're to listen to him as a father speaking to his children. And we should hold on to him. Now this is the final remedy against spiritually a hard heart. And I love this section. Let me read to you verses 12 through 15 here because there's something that may surprise you in what we're supposed to do. Take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be any, in any of you a, an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we've come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end, as it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. I, I think it's beautiful that after this harsh uh, kind of warning from their history, the writer of Hebrews says, today encourage, the word exhort, sometimes translated encourage, encourage each other as long as it is called today. The word for encourage in the Greek is the word parakaleo. It, it, the word for the Holy Spirit in Greek is paraklete, not parakeet, but paraklete. It literally means to come alongside of. We are doing the Holy Spirit's job when we come alongside each other and encourage each other to listen to Jesus and to hold on to Jesus and to consider Jesus. Your salvation, the forgiveness of your sin, and you're being put right with God, that happens once at the cross, accomplished by Jesus and nothing else. He does that when you trust him. But your growth in understanding him, your faith in, in knowledge of who he is, your ability to listen and obey, that is not an individual endeavor. That is a community project. Your faith is supposed to be a community project. You, we need each other. And I, one of the great lies, I think, of the evil one in our culture is that you can do it on your own or with a little Instagram help. <laughs> it's not enough. You need each other. Or once a week, showing up, you know, twice a month. We need each other. Sometimes in the beginning of the fall, we're always talking about groups that are launching, like D groups launching tonight. We have book clubs that have just launched this last couple of weeks, and there's women's Bible study and teams starting this week. And I think, I worry that you think it's more like, great, more church stuff I'm supposed to be doing, more guilt to carry around that I'm not doing enough. That's not it. All that stuff is to give you an opportunity to get with other people who love Jesus, to read what he said to you, and to help each other obey it, follow it, listen to him, consider him, hold on to him. That's what we're trying to do. And if, if there's no one in your life that loves you but loves God more, you know what I mean by that? They'll tell you the truth and you can trust them. 
they'll challenge you, they'll encourage you, then you're a sitting duck for a hard heart. That's why it matters so much that you find a place of community. And it might be like last, yesterday morning. It might be serving together at Buddy Break. That's your community. It might be women's Bible study on Tuesday morning or Wednesday nights. It might be serving in high school ministry. I know there's some D group leaders who get together to study before they leave the kids, the students. I'm, I'm not telling you where, but I'm telling you, if you're on your own, that's not good. And that's not what God intends. What he says about a hard heart, right? Consider Jesus. Think deeply about who he is. Listen to him in his word. And come alongside each other and encourage each other because you need that. You desperately need that. Notice what he says. Encourage each other daily as long as it is called today. I think that's funny. Is it still called today? Is today still today? As long as it's called today. Is it, is it tomorrow yet? No, it's still today. So encourage each other un- until this day is over. When's this day over? Well, then the next day comes, and that day's called today. Like tomorrow will be today when it's today, right? So when do you stop encouraging each other? Never! As long as you're drawing breath and walking through this life, come alongside each other and encourage each other. I've got a friend, his name is Greg, and I won't make him stand up, but he's here. And he was baptized just last month. It was a privilege for me to baptize him. And in his faith story, if you were there, you heard it. I wish you could have heard it. He listed out all the times in his life, not all, but many of them, where he had been resisting God. Isn't that right, Greg? I mean, where he kind of said, ah, like his wife was saying, let's go to a church. He's like, well, all right, you know. And then it was, I was trying to get him to get involved in this uh, men's group. He's like, well, all right. And I made him go to prison, not actually, like, (laughs) anyway. Never mind about that. I'll explain. <laughs> yes. and, and, and every time he was resisting, and then he talked about how each time he sort of kind of grudgingly agreed, God did something in his heart, and he was growing. And he had this great line. He says, so I'm done saying no to God. I love that. And by the way, he mostly hears God through his wife and through me, so Tammy, we have plans for Greg, right? <laughs> Are you done saying no to him? What, what's God saying to you? He's telling you he loves you. What relationship is he calling you out of? What area of your life is he saying, this is not good for you, it's hurting you, it's breaking my heart, and it's damaging, let's talk about it. You don't want to hear it. What, what, what person is he calling you toward? What is God saying to you? And you know he's saying it, but you just haven't wanted to hear it. Why would you not listen to the God who loves you? Like a father loves his child who will never leave you like we sang about. Why would you not listen to him? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you're always speaking and we confess that we're not always listening and even when we are, sometimes we just don't want to hear it. God, open our minds and our hearts and our lives. Help us to stop saying no to you. Protect us from the hardening of our hearts, which would cause us not to hear anymore and to walk away. We thank you that you're a God who loves us that much. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before the benediction and you're dismissed, I just want to, we say this every week, but perhaps this morning you're here and you do feel like you want to hear from God and you need help, you need someone to pray with you or pray for you, we'd love to meet with you down front of the close of the service to encourage you through prayer. Now, go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart because he loves you. Amen? And go in peace.